Thank you so much for, uh, for coming to the Crypto Summit uh, on this Friday. Uh, I am delighted to um, be hosting the Institutional Money and Crypto panel. Uh, on this session, we're going to take a dive inside one of the most fascinating parts of the whole crypto story, and that is what is institutional money thinking, doing, fearing, uh, preparing for in this wild new space? And uh, I'm delighted to have uh, a really prestigious panel to join us and take us on that, that journey today. And um, uh, I wanted to start, if I could, with just the sell-off. Um, I mean, we've, it's just been such a huge story. I mean, just in the last two or three weeks, we've just seen blaring headlines. We've seen the plunge in Bitcoin, Ether, all of these different crypto coins. Um, can you? Share with us, and I'll begin with you, James. Um, could you share with us what are institutional investors thinking, feeling right now about this? I mean, you are the CIO at CCLA Investment Management. You cater to charities, religious institutions, public sector agencies. What kind of feedback are you getting from them right now as they look at what's happening in the marketplace? I would say that investors, by and large, are looking for opportunities to enter the market at materially lower levels on the basis that there has been a recognized correlation in risk participation between, for example, the performance of the S&P 500 and cryptocurrencies. And the, the challenges that institutional investors recognize is that they don't trust fiat currencies in the way that they did. They have observed that since the global financial crisis, central banks have been prepared to print money completely out of the normal expectation of how monetary policy would be set, and therefore currencies control. And they are looking for alternative means of transacting business and actually also as a source of uh, long-term value. You mean as a hedge to quantitative easing? Definitely. And I think huh. that there is very widespread uh, concern that none of us have a clear understanding of what quantitative tightening will look like, how it will work, and what its impact will be on currencies and money supply. Interesting. Uh, Christina, uh, you're a partner at Fabric Ventures. You invest in, uh, I guess you take equity stakes, but you also invest in tokens. Yep. You kind of cover the waterfront in this space. Um, you said earlier that right now is the moment when we separate wheat from chaff in this market. Could you just elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I work quite closely with technologists as well as um, advising investors. And um, many technologists, obviously it hurts a little bit, this washout, but many of them are actually quite happy to see what's happened because um, we all know that there were a lot of scammy projects and substandard projects last year that, that raised a lot of money in these ICO and the fluff detracted, I think, and distracted from their important work. Um, so I think, I, I, think, I think many people are very happy that uh, they can just concentrate on building the technology, which takes time to build, um, especially if they have been funded and been smart about their treasury management. Um, so, and I think perhaps the same is true for institutional investors from the point of view the, of this discussion. Um, many came in last year um, with um, unrealistic expectations. Um, and we're also seeing many of those uh, making redemptions from the funds and so on that they've invested in uh, last year. How big year. a trend is that, the redemptions? I think that's huge, actually. I think yeah. many people are calling it a, an existential crisis of the crypto fund space. Right. Um, huge redemptions, many up to 90% uh, down, not only through performance, but through those redemptions. Is that a justified feeling? This is an existential crisis? Maybe now is the time to get out? No. I Absolutely not. I think that cryptocurrencies do have a long-term future as a means of ensuring efficient transactions. Distributed ledger technology that underpins cryptocurrencies is definitely here to stay and is already making huge differences in real estate transactions, in insurance, in mortgages, and that's not going away either. I see. Eve, uh, your firm, you've got about $12 billion on assets under management. Um, you're in equities, you're in fixed income, but you're also in the, in the crypto space. Um, what's your thesis and do you, do you believe that ultimately the software, the DLT software, the blockchain piece, that is ultimately what's going to deliver to institutional investors at the end of the day? Okay. Uh, the mission of Tobam, as we, we try to state it, is to, uh, to help long-term investors uh, with rational solutions in the context of efficient markets. Uh, uh, an efficient market is, by definition, a market you cannot forecast. Right? It's important to remember 
that we want unforecastable market because we want efficient markets. If markets are not unforecastable and you still want to invest, you're left with only one rational solution, which is to try to increase your diversification. In our mind, uh, for the time being, uh, the most important thesis of Tobam uh, with regards mostly to the Bitcoin, it is that the Bitcoin is definitely a diversifier. So recently there has been some correlation, but on the long term, I think it's, it's really uncorrelated to any other assets. So we have studied the, the case of the Bitcoin. Uh, we are 57 people in my firm, 20 mathematicians. Uh, so. Uh, uh, plenty of us were invested in the Bitcoin for simply uh, taste reason, if I may say so, uh, for, for a long time. And uh, in 2016, we gathered as a group and we realized that there was one uh, characteristic of the Bitcoin that was improving year after year. It was its liquidity. Its liquidity. Yeah. And we thought that if it was going to continue this way, probably some of our clients would become interested into into looking at it. So we developed an investment thesis that we have published in a, in a, uh, in a, in a journal, a scientific journal, uh, that introduces a, a thesis in two, in two parts, a theoretical thesis and an empirical thesis. And in our mind, uh, from, an, from a theoretical point of view, the Bitcoin itself has the right characteristic to potentially become one day an international standard of measurement of value. And a uh, standard of measurement of? Value. Of value, okay. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so in that sense, you believe it is a bona fide currency. I mean, not too long ago, Mark Carney stood I don't on know the stage it's a currency. and said the last it's not a currency. It I did not say it's a currency. I say it's standard. The last standard was a gold standard. I don't think okay. the gold is a, gold so is a currency. Gold is a standard of value. Uh, so it's standard measurement of value, and gold has never been a currency. Okay. And you know, to define whether the Bitcoin is a currency or not, uh, you need to define what is a currency. Uh, uh, to answer whether the Bitcoin is a security, is a currency, is a commodity, it, it's only a question of definition. I had a debate with a, uh, with a very senior lawyer in a firm that had an argument with the Bank de France mm -hmm. and to check whether the Bitcoin was a currency or not. I told him I can't scientifically prove that well, it Nigel, is not. Or we it have is. a lawyer right here, Nigel. Desperate to jump. Yeah. You're a partner at Collier. At Collier at Bristow, you represent ICOs. You represent investors in this space. Are you having these arguments with your clients about definitions and? Well, yes and no. Um, so ultimately, as lawyers, we have to interpret what law is out there at the moment. And I was very interested in the previous panel discussing yeah. potential changes. And I've got a few other things I could add to that. Um, at the moment, no, it isn't a currency because people aren't defining it as a currency. But I agree with Eve that it is a means of exchange and a valuable means of exchange, a bit like gold. But there's no reason why, if things develop, if there's less manipulation, less scams, more respectability in the market, why it shouldn't become an international type of gold standard currency. But that would require huge amounts of international cooperation. And we're sort of, I, I think we're a very long way away from it, it, harmonized. It's only a question of adoption, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, one, one word to summary everything you have said is adoption. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to get to the and, adoption issue yeah. a little later, but I wanted to ask Nigel about, um, just to touch on and pick up with what the prior panel did, is institutional investors, what do they want from okay. the regulators? I mean, in the UK, there's a rather robust process going on, a dialogue with the Bank of England and the FCA and even the Treasury Select Committee is has weighed in. And I mean, do they want a license? Is that what institutional investors want, a stamp of approval? It's difficult. I think there isn't one single market view. There's certainly the UK Crypto Asset Task Force reported very recently, uh, just the end of October. And um, they raised a lot of interesting questions. Um, I don't think we've got firm answers yet as to those questions. But uh, I also looked at the um, ESMA Security Market Group's report to ESMA, rather, uh, which raised some very specific suggestions as to, as to how crypto could be regulated. Um, what do people want? What I've noticed is people want a badge of respectability. So I have quite a lot of, I tend to act for smaller to medium sized enterprises in the crypto space. And uh, they sort of, they take my advice, do I need to be regulated? And I'll often say, well, yes and no. You look at the Crypto Asset Task Force paper, there's actually a specific line saying, and this is one of the differences, and I'm speaking about the UK, and this is one of the specific differences between the UK and the US. In the US, US securities law, and I'm not a US lawyer, but uh, from what I can understand of the Howey test, it's very expansive in terms of 
what can, what can fall in within the scope of security. Whereas in the UK and currently within Europe, and we're currently aligned, uh, within the UK and Europe, um, we have a very prescriptive definition of what is and isn't a security, or what is and isn't various different forms of derivative. And what the UK Asset Task Force said, which I thought was very interesting, was there are some things which look like securities which fall between the cracks, which are not securities. And taking a step back from that, I've had conversations with my clients, and some of them say to me, I don't want to be regulated. It's really way too expensive and cumbersome, and I don't want to be under the gaze of the regulator. Uh, and that was the kind of view I was getting probably up to about a few months ago. And I've noticed since the markets have fallen, I've seen a sort of real strong shift in the other direction. I've got people saying, well, technically, we're not regulated, but we want to be regulated anyway. And what's the best head for us to get regulated for? And if you have like a, a trading platform, they're saying, well, can we be an OTF? Can we be an MTF? Mm -hmm. And this is a very, very big shift from, I mean, they say a week's long time in politics, a year is a long time in crypto. And it's a big shift from what I was seeing this time a year ago. So I guess the big question, uh, and perhaps, Christina, you could address this, is uh, let's say the regulation, there's some form of regulation that comes about that's quite satisfactory to exchanges, to the players in the space. Is that going to be enough to overcome the fear that many institutional investors might have about such a wild market? I mean, how do you, again, yeah. separate that wheat from chaff, the fluff, as you put it, yeah, I mean, from your, the, the companies that you're looking at? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there, are, there are two two parts to this. One is um, there are many kinds of institutional investors, obviously. Um, so, and I, and I think their responses and uh, how they see this, face, this, this space varies enormously. So you have very agile, fast-moving crypto hedge funds. You also have... Um, small, large, medium VC crypto hedge funds that are investing long term and are completely unfazed by this um, uh, moment of uh, uncanny valley of They're crypto. They're unfazed, really. Um, well, they tips. are in the sense that, look, they will have invested in projects that they've done an enormous amount of due diligence on. They're VC investors. They would have inspected the code bases. They, they, you know, the normal way that a VC investor invests, uh, you, you ride through the storm with them because you see a long-term potential in 10 years. This is not, you're not liquidity driven. Are those investors taking equity stakes in the they companies? They take both themselves? equity, but also token investments okay. in something that where you see an enormous potential network value. Um, so, so those kind of, um, of course, when I say unfazed, obviously everyone uh, it hurts when you look at your um, yeah. portfolio at these moments. But, but I think, so there's a very different range. I also am seeing, um, large institutional investors that are investing either from their own balance sheet, um, but those who are investing on behalf of their clients as asset managers obviously uh, have much higher requirements in terms of the compliance that they want and need to see. Um, I might just add from the other side, from the project's point of view, I, I agree with you, people are much more concerned to, to be compliant. I've, I've actually seen that trend for quite a long time, mm -hmm. but um, say a year ago, they could see that there was not going to be any clarity for them and they need to move fast and they wanted to move fast. So they did their best. Well, uh, see, I agree with you on that. And one thing I've seen with my clients is even if they're trying to sell an ICO, which gets between those cracks and there are plenty of cracks in the regulation at the moment, they still want to operate to a more regulatory standard. They want to be sort of uh, preemptively compliant, if you like, which I like, is a phrase I really like from the last panel. Yes, I like that too. And I have heard that as a result of some of the <laughs> announcements that the SEC made last week, that many of these projects are, may preemptively seek to delist themselves and, and, um, and raise funding in conventional ways in the future. I see. In your, your asset management shops, you're, you're investing in this. Do both of your firms, James, perhaps you go first, do you invest in ICOs? Uh, we have done. We have uh, looked at the broader issues of the way in which the industry is maneuvering, and we have viewed cryptocurrencies in a similar way to gold. People can dig it up. They can create more of it. Uh, we are, however, much more interested currently in the long-term opportunities for distributive technologies to fundamentally change the cost base for industry participants. Would you we consider that kind of a software play then? I, I see it as a software play, but, but also an opportunity to contemplate who will be the winners and the losers. And we have seen some of the large American banks, for example, creating private distributed ledger technology mm -hmm. groupings, not the public ones paying out in Bitcoin for computer time, but where the payback is improved efficiency and long-term profitability gain. I think that's going to be a big story. And how do you express that view? Again, do you, are you buying tokens? that will capture that, or Correct. are you taking equity stakes in companies that are making the software? But both. 
both, okay. But the software, I think, is far more difficult to judge who will be the long-term winners and losers. In other words, yeah. one can look at the current state of play. It's very okay. hard to tell, as it was in the dot-com boom, who yeah. actually will be genuinely capable of generating long-term strong shareholder value. Okay. Eve, do you uh, invest in ICOs? No, we don't invest in ICOs. We invest only in the five largest cryptocurrencies. Ah, okay. Uh, in four of them for only experimental purposes and in, in the Bitcoin for more investment purposes. If you started to invest in ICOs, would your clients be okay with that? Or? Uh, I would not be okay with that. You would not be? Why is that? <laughs> uh, because, you know, I, uh, I think that uh, the, the theoretical characteristic of the Bitcoin uh, that we found and that I was talking about, yes. we cannot find them in the ICOs. Uh, so it, it's... Um, uh, an ICO, if it's really a security, I think we need uh, the same data as uh, when we buy a share. For time being, uh, you know, the, the share market is large enough for us to find enough mm -hmm. opportunities of investments. Uh, the fact it is an ICO is not attractive by itself. Okay. okay. Well, not, not in fundamental terms, but there is okay. a technical opportunity. Uh, the, the technology is a share. The, sh the share, Absolutely. why not? Uh, mm -hmm. The ICO, uh, myself, I, am, uh, I need regulation. I like regulation, okay? The fact that share market, uh, stock markets are regulated. Why are regulators here? To help investors. I am investors, so I am always on the side of the regulator, okay? So uh, uh, my goal is not to escape regulation. My whole goal is to enhance a regulation, to help the regulator, to capture the effective risk, etc. cetera. Uh, as I told you, in my mind, the Bitcoin is not a security. Yeah? It's a resource. It's a, it's a commodity, it's a, it's a measure, potentially it could become one day, it's not today, uh, a standard measurement of value, which it's not today. Uh, so uh, my most important goal is to do research around that much more than... You let me probe one here. question yes, in, in terms of the permitted investments that you will consider. I and mean, when one thinks about the range of assets that are now relatively mainstream, like forestry, Forestry is not a regulated asset. Would you not consider forestry for your clients? Just no, to clarify this point. Uh, the Bitcoin is not regulated, and I consider and forestry it. Forestry is not either. Uh, okay, so I, I could. I, I, myself, as, as a, an individual, I invest in, uh, in forestry okay. and timber. So it's not just a regulatory issue. No, it's not a regulatory no. issue. I'm telling That's you, fine. I told you, it's not because it, in a, it is an ICO that I will look at it. Is it more uh, a provenance issue? Uh? Isn't it more of a provenance issue? In forestry, you, you know where it is. The Bitcoin. It could be anywhere okay, or James, nowhere. Is, is the lack of regulation in the crypto world, is that what's attractive to you? It, it, I have a much broader sense of seeking opportunities on a risk-adjusted basis, thinking about supply and demand dynamics. And of course, it's critically important to be regulated in terms of understanding the source of finance, the right. appropriateness of, of customers, the advice, the nature I mean, of just the product. From a financial However, yeah. just because a product or an investment opportunity is not regulated, yeah. to me does not mean it's not a great opportunity to consider. I don't know, earlier, there was a really great phrase in, in the prior panel where um, we heard that there's this idea of the tokenization of everything. And that gets us right back into the ICO kind of space. And I guess the question I'd like um, you to jump in on, each of you, is uh, will ICOs, will this idea of tokenization of everything, will that kind of ruin the space for investing in the long run? Because it's just too unruly. There's just too much fraud. There's too much... Um, yeah, there's just too many dark corners to look in. I don't think so. No? I, I don't think so. I think if you, I, 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 being of a certain vintage, you can look back at the dot-com bubble and yeah. all the things people said, this internet thing is terrible, people are going to use it for all the wrong, all sorts of nefarious purposes. The reality is it's a fantastic tool for most of us, and there are people who use it for nefarious purposes, but that's not the main, that's not the main thing here. And I would say the same with tokenization. It's fantastic technology. You've got this opportunity to have a really global market which looks over borders, and I think this is just what the world needs, but I think good regulation is actually good for business and good for that. Christina? 
No, I, I completely agree. Um, um, obviously, there is some regulation that, that, that was already applicable to any of this stuff that is, that is relatively... Yeah, existing law covers time. a lot, like fraud. Um, but no, the analogy I often make is that, look, it's, it's, it, this technology is like a pencil. It's been invented. It's, it's out. Um, so when we talk about regulation, and this was referred to on the previous panel too, it, it's out of the bag. You can't really um, try to control it uh, uh, fully. And with that pencil, you can do many things. You can... You can do nefarious things. You can kill people with a pencil. You can write a poem. You can uh, you can write a letter to your mother. You can. There are many things you can do. You can write a political pamphlet and circulate that and do and and do radical things. It, it's very similar. So I think. And the point about the zk snarks is very moot. Um, and I think it's very important to note. In a few years' time, at the moment, it's computationally inefficient and so on and so forth. But at, at the point at which it's all very well to say we're going to implement more KYC, more AML, more um, regulations on this space. But at the point at which it's completely invisible, uh, we have to preempt that. And I think, again, a lot of the projects are saying we want to volunteer compliance, even though we can actually <laughs> hide from, from this. So um, I, I would really like to see a more uh, mature conversation with regulators and participants in this industry where we can say, let us find ways where we can voluntarily, for example, create standards or containerize KYC that is more in line with the crypto-native nature of our product. Oh, and it's, it's clear, is it not, that the regulator is mustard keen on some aspects of distributed ledger technology because they see the reduced opportunity for fraud in property transactions, for example. Uh, there's been right. a lot of debate about yeah. how is it that steel tariffs in terms of crossing borders actually can be focused on the original source rather than the final sales point. Now, of course, right. distributed ledger technology makes that trivially simple, and I think it's a huge step forward. No, I mean, you talk to law enforcement and they'll always um, praise the immutability Absolutely. of blockchain slash DLT when they're looking at transactions and exactly. so forth. So there's, it's, it's a paradox, right? Because on the one hand, it's anonymous, but on the other, the actual trans record, transaction record is more transparent than ever. Yeah. Um, I wanted to get back, though, to the, um, to the existential crisis that, uh, that you mentioned, just, again, looking at just what the market has done. Can you just kind of size up what the fallout from that will be on institutional investors, on their mindset? kind of going forward. Um, how does this play out, given where we are right now? I, I don't regard this as an existential crisis. I just regard this as a bump in the road. And in, in institutional investors have had plenty of bumps in the road in conventional currencies and transaction systems. And proving good title, understanding risk is all part of the gamut of accountability that an institutional investor has to deal with. And I would say that there are remarkably few differences between uh, what we are experiencing in cryptocurrencies and how we would necessarily look at a number of the quasi-controlled currencies in the global framework with which we necessarily have to treat if, for example, we want to buy assets in uh, Taiwan or Korea. Okay, but a move, I mean, a move in sterling or the dollar comp you know, compared to what we've seen in Bitcoin would be catastrophic. Well, um, that's, that's true, but anyone who has held the Turkish lira this year because they wanted to have Turkish assets have experienced right. a not dissimilar bad ride. doesn't yeah. mean that anyone wants to consider ever investing in the Turkish economy again. Eve, what do you think? A bump in the road or something on, deeper? On the risk side, huh? uh, yeah. first of all, I think that no long-term investors should ever blacklist a, an asset because it's too risky. It doesn't make sense. If it's twice too risky, just buy 50% of what you were uh, planning to buy. You mean so if you, you believe can, in the thesis? That's, yeah. uh, well, what yeah. matters is whether you believe on the thesis or not. The volatility has absolutely no role to do uh, when you choose whether to invest or not. And the volatility will determine only the size of the investment and should never you know, uh, forbid you from investing in anything. Uh, so volatility, in our mind, is not really a, an input volatility in percentage. The only thing that counts is volatility in dollars. Yeah? So uh, investing you know, $100 million in the S&P is much more risky than buying $1 million of bitcoins. Yeah? So this, I think, is very clear for all of our investors. Yeah. I disagree on that later on, but okay. you keep going. No, go ahead. No, jump in, jump in, Jane. Well, if one were to buy the S&P 500, one has a claim on the long-term profit stream of 500 very large companies, and there is a reasonable probability that on a 10-year view, that investment, in terms of its underlying driver of value, will be immeasurably greater than it is yeah. today. Yeah. Well, that makes it low I risk was, okay, in that I, conventional I was, So you think ICOs are too risky, but... 
Well, no, no, no. you won't go in, no, but no, you no. think the S&P 500 is policy risk is tonal in nature. It goes down over time. It's very in difficult to lose uh, $50 million when you invest in $1 million Bitcoin. $1 million Bitcoin, you will never lose $50 million. Okay? Mm. So I was talking about the variability of the value of the assets. Huh? In terms of variability of the value of the asset, this is the risk, the definition of risk. Okay? Uh, it's much more risky huh? uh, to invest $500 million in the, uh, the S&P than to invest $1 million in the Bitcoin. The variability of the assets, and then I, uh, I, I, I'm not I, sure I agree with that. <laughs> okay, <not> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this isn't where we want to go, okay. but I do think it lies at the heart variability, of the volatility, I think, the dollar volatility, let's talk about technical terms, the dollar volatility of one million of Bitcoin is less than the dollar volatility of $500 million. Right, I want to re I want to read this paper. I'm going to read this paper later. But, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. go, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead no, I mean, what, all I was just going to say, I think the difference with traditional markets and what institutional investors are used to is we have a val you know, valuation frameworks. We do our DCS. We've got CAPM. There are very clear, clear ideas about what cash flows mean and how we project them. And, and basically, value in theory is tied to fundamentals. And you have thousands of analytical eyes on that. Are in the crypto space, um, it's not just animal forces of the, of, the, of the general market nature that are driving valuations. Uh, it's completely, often completely arbitrary. I mean, you will uh, see... And lots of new well, investors, actually unknown. as we know, who have the opportunity to eat the lunch of the incumbent. Absolutely. And, 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 yeah. and actually, we're talking about tiny markets. It's a really niche world. And the liquidity, in my view, uh, is not sufficient to really reflect... Um, any real anal anal analysis of what the fundamentals of value in the space really are. In my if, you, if you compare it with the dot-com boom, the percentage of the whole market that cryptocurrencies take up is absolutely minuscule of course. by comparison to right. dot-coms, which really wiped out an awful lot of people. Right. Um, I would say that I think there will be more. I, I think what we've experienced is like a bit like the dot-com boom, the sort of boom and bust in Bitcoin prices, and I'm talking as a lawyer. But I did actually used to work as an investment professional um, before I became a lawyer. Um, so, uh, we forgive you. Yes, <laughs> I went to the dark side. Um, so what I was going to say is, I, I think, but this is where I can see some, where you, where you have a sort of correlation of regulation, where you have more regulation of ICOs and they become more like regular securities and better regulated, I think you will see more alignment, maybe less volatility. Yes. Um, I think we've seen huge volatility, a little bit like the dot-com boom. Um, but I agree with you in terms of fundamentals, where are the assets underlying the... ICOs, if you know that there are assets there because these are regulated securities or equivalent to regulated securities, and I think there is less volatility, not no volatility, I mean, even real estate funds and, and massively and vary in another price. Another point it is that investors are risk takers. Uh, if right. uh, if the, the future of the Bitcoin was proven already, uh, it would not make sense to buy it because the price would be stable right. and uh, mm -hmm. the growth would be in the past. Uh, so it's because it is risky because it's mm -hmm. a potential you know, uh, international standard measurement of value, that it is potentially interesting to look at it now and, to check, and to check whether it's a good diversifier James, to what you have that? or not. I agree one should look at it. My, okay. my issue fundamentally is that the drivers of return are non-normal in the context of the fundamentals. And therefore, the framework for considering value is much more to do with short-term shifts in supply and demand rather than an, uh, an underpinning for the long haul. And therefore, I think that whereas volatility is kernel in nature for long-term assets, there's no reason to believe that volatility will be kernel for Bitcoin. And I worry, therefore, but it's a lot riskier than it looks. OK. <laughs> <laughs> we can disagree. <laughs> we can disagree. But in, term, in terms of um, the, uh, we, we talked about how unknown the market is. I mean, there's always kind of suspicions of market manipulation that we don't know why the price is moving the way it is in the crypto space. How, how important is that to your clients? I mean, are your clients asking questions of you and saying, do you know why it's doing this? Do you know why the price is going? Do you have a good answer for that? Our clients are, uh, are clear with our thesis. Our thesis is diversify, 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 okay? okay? Uh, there are two ways to run a portfolio on this planet. Either you have a crystal ball or you diversify. Uh, so right. it's, there are only two ways, in fact. Huh? On our side, unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball. Okay? Uh, you can be sure that if I had one, I would not diversify. Unfortunately, I don't have one, which means that my only aim when I build a portfolio is to try to build a portfolio which is well diversified. Okay. Uh, and I'm simply saying that today, from an objective point of view, 
okay, based on theory and empirical findings, there is a room for a small drop of Bitcoin in a portfolio. Okay. Simply because it increases the objective diversification of the portfolio. Got it. All right. I'm talking about a drop. Ah, very wow. often I use uh, this image of uh, chlorine. Chlorine, you know, is a combat yeah. gas. It's a very deadly uh, gas, but if you add a drop of chlorine <laughs> in your water, it becomes like drinkable. It. <laughs> yeah? mm -hmm. So it's a question of dosing. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. only a question of dosing. Yeah? If you take it pure, you're going to die. If you put a drop of it in a pool, you can swim in the pool. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, and that's, uh, that's uh, we believe that if you have a, an international equity light portfolio, adding 0.3% of your assets in Bitcoin will actually drop lower the volatility of your portfolio. But this is scientific. But if the exposed volatility of Bitcoin is seen to go up, you will then become a seller, presumably, because the marginal contribution to risk from your Bitcoin holding has increased, so therefore the weighting has to reduce in order to get back yeah, to risk parity, uh, uh, right? Uh, it depends on risk. If the price stay, stays stable and the uh, and risk uh, increases, of course, this is what I will do. So if, if the price drops, and the volatility uh, increases. Uh, increases less than the drop of the price, I would so need to make, buy it. You are making some implicit assumption about price as well as volatility, therefore. No, no, I'm looking at the current price. Only. All right, gentlemen. Well, I'm sorry. To, I mean, we, we can carry on. We'll carry on Absolutely. outside and have this dis debate. But um, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thank as you. you can see, this institutional investing piece of... Uh, of the crypto space is really dynamic and very interesting. And I would just love to thank Eve and James and Nigel and Christina for joining us and sharing their perspective. Thank you so much. Please give them a hand. Well